Thanks for joining us here on 9 News Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi. 9 News on Tuesday, March the 14th, hosting the second of the three debates for the mayor of Denver's office and one of those three moderators for that debate. Kyle Clark joins us now. Howdy. And Kyle, lots of takeaways from a bit more of a fiery, I think it would say, say encounter on Tuesday night. What were your top takeaways? So I... Part of that is the goal of a debate, which is to have the candidates debate each other. There's lots of forums where they get up and they take the microphone and they repeat the same three stories that they tell every single time and then they, they uh, sit down again. But we want people to debate, to talk back and forth with each other about areas where they disagree and there's areas where they really truly disagree. And I think what we heard in the debate is that there are instances where they don't just disagree, but they think that other people are proposing things that are illegal, that are immoral, that are dangerous. And there's folks on that stage that honestly don't have a very high opinion of one another. And I think some of that came out last last night for, for voters to see. Uh, but we got to remember, this is a race that could be 9, 10, 12 way open race at this point with <laughs> ballots in the hands of voters. That's the crazy thing, that it's this wide open with ballots in the hands of voters. Everybody talks back about that 2003 election when John Higginsburg came out of nowhere. John Hickenlooper had a sizable lead in the polling at this point in that race. Mm. So out of nowhere is very different than what we have here when it is truly this wide open. Okay, so with that, it does seem like maybe, to me, one of my takeaways, I'll just say this, and yep. I'll defer to you on this yep. one as a moderator, but it did seem like that based on the way the candidates were acting, Mike Johnston almost seems like a front runner based on the fact that it seemed like a lot of the candidates were going after him specifically, weren't they? Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I, I think Mike Johnson was probably already one of the front runners going into the debate. Uh, he's number two in fundraising behind Kelly Bruff. <coughs> Pardon me, there's a big time IEC and outside group that's spending money. A bunch of rich people who want to get him elected. Uh, they're spending a lot of money on, on his behalf. He's a known name in the city. He had a lot of, a lot of things going for him. But one of the truest tests of, of front runner status is when we open up the ability for candidates to question each other. People are either going to ask a friendly question to try to put an arm around somebody, or they're going to ask an unfriendly and an aggressive question, which I happen to like. Uh, and then who do they go after with the unfriendly questions? And most of them went after Mike Johnston. So it's clear that they think that he's the one that they need to knock down a peg to have a shot. And somebody who got knocked down a peg was <laughs> Trinidad Rodriguez, who seemed to get the treatment that Chris Hansen got in the first debate, where a lot of uh, the other candidates went after Chris Hansen's first debate. This debate seemed like Trinidad Rodriguez was receiving quite a few blows. Yeah, I think that that's fair. And I think the commonality between the Chris Hansen experience, uh, the, you know, please sit in that chair and I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, and what happened to Trinidad Rodriguez is both of them have done or said something that caused the majority of the other candidates on the stage to go, what are you thinking? Like, like, what mm. in the world? With Chris Hansen, it's this ad that opens up with a montage of images. Seven out of the eight people are black or brown folks who are committing crimes or appear to be homeless. And black and Latino candidates in the first debate told Chris Hansen, like, that's a bad look, man. Like, even if you don't mean to, that's a bad look. That does harm. You know, that unconsciously sits with people. So just change it, would you? He told people their concerns were overwrought. He uh, brought up his multiracial children. He dismissed their concerns. In going into this debate... We knew ahead of time that the news that came out of my interview with Trinidad Rodriguez about a week ago was he, for the first time, really fleshed out his plan to forcibly, uh, not incarcerate, forcibly hold a number of people experiencing homelessness in Denver. He's been running on this since the start. He hasn't been shy about this. He, mm. he wants people involuntarily committed for mental health holds or for substance abuse holds. You can hold somebody for 72 hours in Colorado, and then you got to go to a judge, and it's a really high bar to get a three-month hold. Trinidad Rodriguez, in my interview, was, was finally pressed, like, what does this mean? Where are you going to put people? How is this going to work? And he explained that he wants to build this camp that he calls a field hospital when he made clear for the first time, yes, I want people held there for three months or longer against their will. So you're talking about a situation where there's clinical staff and then there's guards because people can't leave. And when I asked him, how many people are we talking about? There's an estimated unsheltered homeless population in Denver, 1,400, 1,500 people. And he told me upwards of 1,000 people. So we're talking about forcibly institutionalizing the majority of Denver's homeless population against their will four months of treatment at a facility. Reaction to that, especially from folks on the political left, was through the roof. Joe Salazar, who served in the uh, state legislature, ran on successfully for attorney general. He's a civil rights attorney, said that's an internment camp. You can't do that. That's illegal. Uh, Joanne Rocha, who is a, an RTD director uh, and, a, and a progressive, 
came out and called him a fascist. And we asked him about those comments. And other people on, on the stage were saying, like, you're talking about an internment camp, man. Like, that's not cool. And he points out, well, no, we do have the ability in single instances to take people against their will and treat them. But what he's talking about doing it on a mass scale in an outdoor camp made a lot of the other candidates uncomfortable. And if we're being frank, I'm not sure that him explaining it made it any better. These are, this is not an internment camp. This is a place where we can provide the standard of care for healing for people who are suffering and dying on our streets today. And it is the right thing to do. It's not illegal. It, it's just not illegal. There's Title 727 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. Because at one point then he started talking about having the National Guard do security. So you're bringing in the military to your camp now. And I, I think there were a number of folks up there on the stage that thought that that was a disqualifying position. And I mean, based on the reaction of quite a few of the other candidates, it seemed like they were going after that pretty hard. Um, uh, to that, I guess from a broader perspective, homelessness was a big topic throughout the course of the night. And I think the first debate, it was a bit more nuanced. I think we were talking about several different issues on Tuesday night, on Tuesday night, March the 14th, it seemed pretty centered on homelessness, didn't it? Yeah, I think, so the difference between this debate and the first one, we knew that not everybody was going to watch both of them, so we wanted to cover the main issues. We started out with, in this latest debate, with a leadership component, talking about the fact that you're going to lead a, a workforce of more than 10,000 people, discretionary budget of one and a half million dollars, and do you have the executive experience to do it? Because, mm. I mean, some of these candidates have never been in elected office. Some of them have never run a large operation of any size. So I think we needed to hear, you know, where are people coming from on that. And then our next topic was homelessness because of the fact that in our Survey USA poll, uh, in conjunction with Denver Gazette and MSU Denver, Colorado Politics, it found that people are overwhelmingly concerned about that issue in crime. Some of the candidates conflate those two issues as being the same. Some of them do not. We knew there was some overlap there. That's where we began the debate. And as the candidates have fleshed out their plans, they do have really strong disagreements on that. So we spent a lot of time there. Uh, how would you clarify or how would you group the different positions? I know there's 11 candidates. It's a yeah. lot of different ways. But how would you clarify their positions based on what you saw on Tuesday night? So, again, not everybody is going to be in the mm. exact same camp on everything. And I have to consult the list because there were 11 on stage last night. Um, so if you're looking at, like, your, your true progressive lane, like your furthest left lane, that is, that's Lisa Calderon, that's Leslie Herod, that's Terrence Roberts, uh, and that's also Ian Tafoya, who was not on stage last night because of how he pulled in that Survey uh, USA race. Then you've got kind of more like a, like a center left or establishment Democrat kind of lane. Uh, that's going to be your Al Gardner, Chris Hansen, Mike Johnston, uh, to some extent Debbie Ortega, uh, and then you've got your, they'd be Republicans if we didn't know better because they're in Denver lane, you know, <laughs> where if you just, if you took away everything else, you just listen to what they're saying, you'd be like, oh, these are Republican candidates for office. Uh, that would be Kelly Bruff. That would be Trini Rodriguez. That would be Andy Rougeau. That would be Thomas Wolf, And that would be Kwame Spearman, who was not in last night's debate because of how he polled in the Survey USA poll. So, I mean, that was, let me see. I mean, I mean, one two, three, four, that's five, five people out of the 17 running in like a solidly center right lane. Only one of them's a Republican, Andy Rougeau. But again, if you strip away everything else, you just listen to what they're saying, you'd be like, oh, those are, those are Republican candidates. Some of them centrist Republicans, some of them further right Republicans. So you got about five or six in the progressive lane. You got about five or six in the essentially Republican lane. And then you've got a centrist lane that's maybe like eight candidates or so, or how many are left? Six? Seven? Yeah. yeah. Something <laughs> yeah. like that. So is the plan, uh, would the, the plan on, on their end be, is it just trying to get to the runoff and uh, perhaps that the, uh, the progressive or the centrist candidates kind of siphon a lot of their votes and divvy it up and then maybe one of them, one of the more center right? Again, we're in Denver, which is obviously a pretty left-leaning yeah. city. What's the game plan there, basically? Well, so the thing that complicates this is your money leaders, okay? Your money leaders, your fundraising leaders, which give them the advantage in terms of putting up TV ads, being able to do a lot of get out of the vote, that kind of thing. Um, Kelly Bruff, who's in the right-leaning lane, has the most money. Mike Johnston in the center lane has the second most amount of money. Andy Rougeau, who is self-funding the Republican in the far right lane, has the third most money. Then it's Leslie Herod in the progressive lane. Lisa Calderon, who's got some traction according to the polling, she finished third in the last mayor's race, does not have a lot of money to work with at all. Mm. So you have the money kind of spread out all over the place. 
I think the thing that might happen that we aren't talking about enough is the fact that we could end up with the two-person runoff. Because, again, we're going from 17 to 2 overnight on April 4th. Doesn't win all like presidential field. Goes 17 to 2. The two people in the runoff might not disagree on much. I mean, I, I think hmm. there's, there's, a pre, there's a decent likelihood that it might be two of the centrist establishment Dems. I think it could be two of the people in the center right lane. I think it would be very hard for it to be two people in the progressive lane, uh, just based on how much money and how many how many candidates with strong messages are in kind of the center or center right. Um, so obviously, like you know, at least Calderon thinks she's got a good chance of making the runoff. Leslie Harrod thinks she's got a good chance of making the runoff, and she's got good organization. She's been in, in the race for a while, so I certainly wouldn't count her out. Um, but I mean, you could have Mike Johnston and somebody else who's from the center. You could have Kelly Bruff and somebody else who's from the the center right. There might not be a wildly divergent ideological choice hmm. before Denver voters in the runoff. Could happen. Certainly could happen. I think if you're gonna if you were gonna predict what was gonna happen just based on organization, fundraising, that kind of thing, you might say it's somebody from the center and somebody from the center right. How does that go over an increasingly progressive city? You yeah. Know what I mean? uh, but uh, so maybe the easier way to say it is I don't think there's a guarantee that there's a progressive in the runoff. So it could be a uh, Johnston Bruff quite easily. Sure. Uh, I, I, sure. I know that's not a prediction there, but um, any final takeaways from the debate? Um, well, uh, people get mad when I don't mention their names. Uh, Terrence <laughs> Roberts was mad that I didn't give him a shout out for the last debate, and in which he, he did a really good job. So I'm just going to go through the names and just kind of give you an idea of what you're uh, checking out if you tune into the debate. I encourage you to watch and form your own opinions. Uh, again, this is just kind of like a, you know, how did things go last night? Uh, Kelly Bruff, I think is a very confident candidate. She's a very prepared candidate. She's been in city government for a long time. I can't tell if the debates aren't her thing or if she just doesn't think she has anything to gain by being an aggr aggressive debater because she truly just likes to hang back and just let other people do the thing. She'll answer every question. I she's, noticed that too. She's, she's very direct, uh, but she's not going after people. She's never inserting herself in conversations, even ones where she has expertise. I'll look her way and she's not interested in getting in. She hmm. just kind of hangs back. Uh, Lisa Kelleron is the exact opposite. She wants to be heard on everything. She's got four degrees. She wants to tell everybody about her four degrees and what she knows. She's not shy about telling other people that they don't know what they're talking about. I think she did it to three or four people last night. She consistently is telling people, you don't know what you're talking about. I think she said to Trini Rodriguez last night, that this is what happens when people who don't know a lot are very dangerous. This is why people with a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. Um, there's a reason why we have a separation of branches, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative. Uh, judges determine involuntary commitment, not the executive branch. There is a process for taking away people's constitutional rights and human rights. Um, but she's routinely telling people, you have no idea what you're talking about. We'll see if voters like that approach or if they dislike that approach. Uh, Al Gardner, who was not in our first debate, he was in this debate. He's an IT guy who served on a bunch of uh, boards and commissions. He is a really charming, thoughtful guy. And I think he had a much perhaps bigger role in last night's debate than any of us expected because he would get in and he would have something to say. Now, sometimes what he's saying is, I don't know how to, how to solve homelessness. Do voters like that? Or are they like, you seem like a cool guy, but I want somebody with a plan. Uh, but it was clear that the other candidates on stage know him from his work in the city. They like him. And he had stuff to say last night. Uh, and he also was very critical of what he called an internment camp. Uh, Chris Hansen uh, had a had a better debate than the first one, but the bar was the floor. I mean, that first debate was pretty brutal for him trying to explain away that ad. Um, so I don't know that he had any great standout moments last night that really kind of, you could hear the audience behind us. Mm. And you could hear them not just rooting for their favorites, but, but reacting to moments that captured people's attention from a number of candidates. And I'm not sure that anybody ever, if Chris Hansen ever captured a moment with the audience last night. Uh, Leslie Harrod, also surprisingly, not a super aggressive debater, uh, which is interesting because she's widely regarded as a very good public speaker. I wonder if part of the issue there, and she's talked openly about this, is people's preconceptions, stereotypes, judgments about a woman of color being aggressive. Uh, she's been criticized recently by former staff members who say that she was horrible to work for. I asked her about that last night. So that might be another reason why she's not looking to be hmm. very publicly aggressive. She's certainly assertive. She asserted herself at a number of times during last night's debate, but I wouldn't necessarily describe her as an aggressive debater. And I wonder how much of that has to do with the workplace complaints against her and then just stereotypes about women of color. Um, 
Oh, where are we now? Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson. Uh, <laughs> Said he was going to end homelessness in his first term. I, that's a hell of a pledge. You're going to end homelessness, which no major American city has ever done. You're going to do it in four years. Uh, he's he's the hope guy. All right, he's not short on hope. That's his that's his that's his brand. Like Obama's retired it, and he's picked it up. So he's the hope guy. Um, but you heard other candidates last last night, uh, like Kelly Bruff, say it's not realistic. You heard other candidates suggest it's not honest. That, I think, is going to sharpen into an argument. Like, it's one thing to say you're too optimistic. It's another thing to say you're being deceitful. Mm. You know what I mean? So I think that's going to be one of his challenges going forward. Uh, but he's got lots of money to play with and lots of money to being, being spent on his behalf. And last night, he took question after question after question after question from us, from the other people on the stage. But, but he loves this stuff. He loves to debate. This is his jam. You know, he's very comfortable doing that. And he, I think he probably walked out of there secretly happy. That's like, well, it's clear that people think that I'm the front runner because they're all going after me. So he took every question with a smile. He used his question to try and mend fences with Terrence Roberts, who he had kind of a falling out with. Um, so he Holly, clearly yeah. is feeling pretty, pretty confident. Uh, Debbie Ortega, I think, has, has struggled in the debate in the sense that, and I'm sure somebody's going to send me an angry email about this, no candidate has been muddier on the issues and debates and confused about what's being asked and what's going on than Debbie Ortega. Um, hmm. And other candidates, again, last night, jumped in to help her with questions. We saw that in the first debate when Kelly Bruff jumped in to help her about supervised injection sites. And I think it was Leslie Harrod jumped in to help her on affordable housing. Last night, Leslie Harrod jumped in to help her when I was asking her whether we need one more task force to solve our crime problems. So when the other candidates are jumping in to assist somebody, it typically means they really like the person, they really respect the person, and they're trying to mercy rule them out of a tough situation. So that happened a couple times last night. Terrence Roberts. Uh, Terrence Roberts, uh, I think for folks who are, are not familiar with Terrence Roberts, anti-violence activist, um, He's, he's really compelling and just kind of like from a personality perspective, regardless of whether you like his policies or not, his policies are all pretty far left progressive stuff. Um, but he's just a very charming, gregarious guy. He's funny. The other candidates like laughing and joking around with him. He doesn't take personal offense to anything. Like he was just, just a fun person to have on stage. And he will also say, and I have deep experience and I'm the best person to lead the city. We'll see if that, we'll see if that connects with people. But there are a few folks on that stage who you could tell were having a joyful time. Lisa Calderon, Mike Johnson, Terrence Roberts, and probably Al Gardner were having a joyful time up there. They clearly love doing it. Uh, Trini Rodriguez uh, did not have a good tough time. night. <laughs> uh, tough night for Trini Rodriguez, and and I, I think. The tough thing for Trini Rodriguez is the more he talks about his uh, field hospital that other people call an internment camp, I think the more the criticism builds. But that's the basis of his campaign. He didn't have a big other issue other than I'm going to put him in a camp. So that's where we are. Andy Rougeau, not in our first debate because he didn't take fair elections funds. The, our first debate was uh, in conjunction with the fair election funds. Uh, so he was in that debate last night. Uh, he obviously enjoys the combative back and forth. The first question to him was why he said seven false things in one interview, including accusing other people on the stage of illegally paying themselves salaries out of campaign funds. Um, he said that he disputed it, it was false but provided nothing to back it up at all, and then eventually said, no, they aren't paying themselves uh, salaries. But I think he likes the debate, too. I think he enjoys it. I think the fascinating thing for him is that he thought that he was going to be the only person running from the right on this crackdown on homelessness, hire more cops, that sort of thing. And those are all majority positions now in the race. That's, that's tough sledding. That said, his dad's the CEO of Sephora. He's pumped $750 million of his own money into the race. He can make a go of this because he's got lots of money to play with. The question is, does he have a lane when so many other people are echoing the same things that he's saying and they have public sector experience? Which he tried to say last night is actually a demerit and not a positive if they've been in the public sector before. Finally, that brings us to Thomas Wolfe. He's the investment banker who's running a single-issue campaign to end the encampments. Uh, he very clearly outlines a fiscal... Uh, a, a, a fiscal rationale for ending the encampments. They hurt tax value, so they hurt the schools, they hurt Denver Health, that kind of thing. It's basically his only issue, and he says that the other politicians promise too many things to too many different people. The thing that I think has been a tough point for him, both in my one-on-one -on -one interview with him and then last night in a conversation with Marshall Zellinger, is when you ask him, do you care about the people who live on the streets or do you just want to sweep them out of view? He won't say that he cares.
even when directly mm. asked. Won't and even give the politician, I do care. No, but... he won't even say, he, he will not say mm. it. He will not say it. Um, and I don't know if he considers that to be pandering. I don't know if he just thinks that that's not his viewpoint. I don't know if he thinks that that appeals to a certain group of people, if it's just his personality type. But even when you ask him, like, this feels a little cold, man. Like, I, I get your point, mm. but, like, do you care about these human beings? And when Marshall asked him last night, will you say that you care? He would not. He would mm. not. Leading other candidates on the stage to say, I care, and here's what I'd do, and here's what I would do. He, I mean, no care bear on that issue. I mean, he is just not, he's not having it. And again, the question is, can somebody like Thomas Wolf running on a single issue that is now the majority position in the race find a lane? With tough love, basically. Yeah. Uh, or, so yeah. that's that's the 11 candidate field. How about that? Good thing we're on 9 News Plus because they would have cut me off on 9 News <laughs> yeah. an hour ago. Been yelling, uh, <laughs> <laughs> rap, 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 rap. Um, so uh, you mentioned ballots are out. Yep. Uh, May, uh, April the 4th is yep. the election. Um, we've got a third debate. Can you tell us about that? Third debate will be after April 4th. Date TBD. It will involve the two uh, folks in the runoff. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, preparing a debate for 11 or 13 candidates is unlike anything I've ever done before. It's a bit of a pain in the keister. Um, but hopefully it's been useful to people to not just hear talking points, to actually hear substance, to hear them challenged, and to hear them talk to each other. Mm. So part of me is kind of sad that the next debate is just going to have two people. It's going to be kind of like a normal political debate. Which seems kind of lame. It does seem kind of Are you going to run a half marathon after the next? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I might have gotten some energy out with a, with a, a run today, post-debate. <laughs> so thanks for having me back in the Bianca Drome. In the box. You're back in the yeah, box. You're back welcome in the box. back in the box. We'll have you back in the box soon. But Kyle, thanks for joining us. My pleasure.